Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. How many of you can go through a day without worrying about something? Wow. I didn't actually expect anyone to be brave enough to raise their hand on that one. Good. Can you teach the rest of us? No? No? I think it's very interesting that Jesus starts this 14th chapter, which is this 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, is a passage that I often talk to people about as I'm meeting with them to do a funeral for a family member. Because this is the passage that we hear at funerals, right? Don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. God, I'm going to God and I'm making a place for you in God's house, right? This is about heaven, right? Maybe. I like that answer. That's a good answer. The question is really, what is heaven and where is heaven? Is heaven a physical place that we go to? But this is a passage of scripture that I talk to people about when they're getting ready to do funerals. Because it's comforting, right? To think that Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. That it's all about where we're going to be at some point in time in the future. You see, there's several issues with this passage, though. It's don't let your hearts be troubled. In the Greek, it's not hearts. It's do not let your, plural, heart, singular, be troubled. He's talking to all of the disciples as a collective group. Do not let your heart be troubled. The community's heart. And the problem with this is that that's a passive verb. To be troubled is passive, means that it's something that happens to the heart that is beyond our control. Are there things that trouble you that are beyond your control? Parents? Things that your children do? (laughs) Right? While they are a little bit under your control, they are their own human beings, so they do what they want. Right? And that's troubling sometimes to us as parents. What about everything that's going on in the world right now? There's civil unrest going on in the world. There's things that are happening. There's groups that are talking about the end of times and things that are happening all over the world that are very troubling if we stop and think about them for a moment. And Jesus tells us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Um, Excuse me, Jesus. Um, A few chapters earlier in the Gospel of John, you had problems with us when your, your spirit was troubled, the exact same word in the Greek is used of Jesus saying that his spirit is troubled when he's talking to the disciples earlier about his death. Jesus himself is troubled. So if Jesus is troubled, you expect us not to get troubled? You expect us to be able to handle this better than you, Jesus. Is that what you're telling us? You want us to take this and to be able to handle these situations better than you yourself can? Well, of course, Jesus is talking about his physical death, and any that would trouble any of us. But we should not be troubled by that, right? Because what's going to happen when we die? It's a doorway. It's not the end. So Jesus tells the disciples, do not let your heart be troubled. Be believing in God and keep on believing in God, and be believing in me and keep on believing in me. Right? Keep on believing in me. Believe in God and believe in me are present tense verbs which connotate an action that continues on and on and on and on. While we're not supposed to let our hearts get troubled by anything that's happening in life, even if we do, we're still supposed to believe in God and believe also in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus tells us that in his Father's house... What a lovely word there. House. What does it mean? It can mean house. It's also used in the Gospel of John to mean community or household. So is God, is Jesus talking about a physical place that we're all going to go at some future point in time to reside? Can you imagine the house that would have enough rooms in it for all of us to have our own room? Just those of us gathered here, let alone those who are part of this community but aren't here tonight, And let alone those who are connected with us because they are part of the body of Christ. How many would that be? And how big would this house be? Can you imagine having to clean this house? (laughs) 
Is it a house or is it a household? Is it a community? Does it mean a relationship? Because there are many dwelling places. This word is also a little bit interesting. It's not necessarily a physical place. This could also connotate a household relationship. Like Jesus is coming to dwell within us. When God tells us that he's going to always be with us, and Jesus tells that he's always going to be with us, and yet he's not physically with us now, but we have who with us? The Spirit is with us, which connotates that God is still with us. He's dwelling with us right now, right here. See, we take this scripture as being a comforting thing that tells us about how when we pass away or our relatives pass away, that they have gone to be with God. And I believe they have gone to be with God, but it's not like some magical, mystical place that we're going to get beamed up to when we pass away. Heaven is a relationship between us and God. Because in my Father's community, there are many relationships. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place, not a physical place, but He prepares you to receive God and to have God to be with you. Because see, here's the interesting part. You've all heard this last verse, right? Not the last one, the second to last one used probably in several ways, to say that if you're not believing the way that we believe, then you're not believing the right way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. Is that what it says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. Isn't that how you've heard it quoted to you? What does the verse actually say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not God. It's Father. And when he says no one here, he's talking to the people that he means no one. And who is he talking to when he says this? The disciples. Yes. He is talking to the disciples. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one of you can get to the Father except through me. Does that change the way that that verse sounds now? No one, you included, me included, can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ, except through Jesus dying on the cross. We can't have access to the Father except for the fact that Jesus went here to die for each and every one of us. Except for the fact that Jesus followed through and was troubled enough in His Spirit to be killed on a cross so that each and every one of us could have a place with God. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come back and take you to Myself. So that where you always are, I am too. And where I am, you will be too. It's exactly what the letter to Ephesians talks about too. Those of us who were far off, that's everybody in this room, because nobody in this room was ever a Jew, were they? No. So we were all Gentile scum and far off. But because of the blood of Christ, we've been brought close and made a place that we are now aliens and strangers, but accepted into the household. We have a place as the slave does, as the son always does, in the household, because of Jesus doing what he did. Because Jesus is the way that we get access to the Father. So don't let your heart be troubled. Be believing in God and keep on believing in God. And be believing in Jesus and keep on believing in Jesus. So when things get hard, as they will, when things get troubling, as they will, take heart and know that Christ is always with us and do what he tells the disciples at the beginning of John chapter 14. Don't be troubled. Just believe.